Salutations, Dufos. This is your fabulous leader, the Queen of Shade, coming at you with a special presentation. Moving right along. Next, next, next. We are speaking to some most intelligent, most beautiful, most inspiring people. And it's going so well. And I plan to get to all of you. But this man's time has come today to have a conversation with me. This young man is an educator music artist, event host, photographer, radio host, YouTuber, an amazing, amazing human being. And we're gonna talk to him today. Thank you. So without further ado, you're welcome. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to Jamar Marain. Yes, yes. Hi. Thank you so much for having me on your platform. Hey, it's my pleasure. Um, you sent me a little homework. Just a little bit, you know? Yes, and get this. Late last night at about 11, uh -huh. I got to it. Okay. What you sent me was your documentary, and it was two parts. Yes. And I commented because I literally sat up in my bed mm -hmm. and said, oh, my God, this is epic. Mm. I literally got up. I was like, I watched both parts and uh, your story, your journey, we're going to get into some lightly, lightly, it's only a one hour show, but like, yeah. we're going to get into your story. And I, I just, I, I consider this an honor. Whenever I see someone doing what they were called to do, going through so much adversity and struggle, and still choosing love mm -hmm. and light and not violence. I am touched, moved and inspired. So I'm gonna bring them all in now because they're like, what the hell is she talking about? <laughs> so we are going to get to it. So Mr. Jamar Murray. I wanna say though, um, that it's an honor both ways. Um, so like, I just really kind of found out about you. I think I've seen like your videos here and there, um, but after watching, all your previous, you know, interviews, because I did a little bit of homework as well, <laughs> had to make sure that, I, that I knew, you know, what was going on and make sure that I that I appreciated the platform that I was on. So I did go back and watch some other interviews. And I think that you're really great at what you do. And I also can really tell that your work ethic is crazy. And I really admire it. And I also even listen to some of your music. And oh I, love, I love what I heard. And I'm not, lying to you. you ain't have no homework. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not lying to you. I love what I heard. Like, you're great at what you do. And I, I love what you bring to the table. And even the way that you do your interviews and the way that you say things and the way you word things, it demands my ear. Like I, I have to listen to what you're saying. And I admire that about you. Thank you so much. You know, no I had an interview to, earlier today with a young, uh, he's a physique competitor, big guy. His name is Darino Mackey. He said the same thing. He said, when, yeah. you, speak, when you speak, we listen. Mm -hmm. And he said, what, what you say could be law because it, it, tells us of what a world could be if there wasn't violence and everybody worked together. And, yes. But you know what, to be honest, that's the Libra in me. We believe in utopian societies and <laughs> harmony. So that's where that comes from. But anyway, back to you, <laughs> back to you, because you are the reason we are here and I'm gonna get into it. So tell everyone where you're from. Um, I am from Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Born and raised. Um, I in in your documentary, you talked about, and we're not going to go there yet. But you talked about, you know, what your household was like. Mm -hmm. You said that you grew up in a household where you had your auntie, your grandmother, yep. and your mother. Yep. And you talked about how that environment allowed you to get the things you needed, get the things you wanted, and um, shaped you. Yeah. And I, I truly appreciated watching that. I was just, I was so moved by that because what we don't understand, and I've been saying this lately, and I'm going to keep on saying it, is that we are a culmination of every sound we've ever heard. That's Steve, Stephen Mackey said that. Steve Mackey, he's a vocal coach out of Los Angeles, but that's mm -hmm. true but we are also a culmination of everything that we experience. 
And what people don't understand is whether those experiences are bad or good, Mm -hmm. they shape us, they mold us, even if we have to unlearn some things. Yeah. See what I'm saying? So you talked about your childhood, your, your youth. Could you talk about that a little bit? So, yeah, like you said, I lived in the house with my mom, uh, my grandma, and my auntie. So I kind of had, like, three moms. It definitely takes a village. That ain't even half the village, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was kind of cool because um, I was that spoiled kid. Like, like everything that I wanted, I pretty much got. Like, you know, they all, they all would, you know, pitch in and be able to help. Um, so it wasn't until I was probably – I was definitely in middle school. I think seventh grade – is yeah. when um, everybody like split up and like Monty had her own house, my grandma had her own house, my mom had her own house. Yeah. Um, and then that is when I started to realize like what the struggle even was. Like for the first time I had to watch my mom struggle and watch my mom, you know, worry about whether or not she was gonna be able to make ends meet. And that was new for me. So like that, that like really, really like crushed me in a way to see my mom like going through stuff that I've never seen her experience. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you are right as far as like saying, every part of our, you know, life and, and everything that we've seen and everything, you know, forms us. And even creatively, like even this wall that I'm behind, this is all my favorite artists, my favorite celebrities, my favorite movies. And all of this, you know, is me. Yeah. These are all my reference points that, that created who I am today as a, as an artist, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Speaking of that fabulous wall behind you, <laughs> there's a lady in a pink looking like fur coat. Right here. Who is yeah. That? Who is that? that? Is- Keisha Cole. Yeah, that's Keisha Cole. Yeah, I thought so. Yep. <laughs> Fabulous. Shout out to Keisha Cole. She looked Shout out to Keisha Cole. She's she so looked, dope. Yeah, she looked good. And yeah. she's an amazing artist. She is. But you are right. We are a culmination of those things. And not just those things, but the decisions we made mm-hmm. because of those things. You yeah. Know? So, um, in your life, because even as I watched the documentary, you, like you said, it takes a village. You had some very, very dope people supporting you. Was it mm-hmm. always like that? I would say so. Yes, yes and no. Um, so I, I feel like I have a really, really great support system. Yeah. And it kind of just really depends on like what aspect, right? So overall um I know that I'm supported but I didn't think I've always felt that way right especially when it comes to like me being myself like it was my me making my documentary and me coming out and me just you know living in my truth was like one of the biggest and hardest things for me to ever decide to do because I didn't know how I was going to be supported yeah you know but I feel like the documentary taught me that you never know who's going to support you until you put yourself out there to be supported right you know so now that I've done that I, I definitely see, you know, how much people love me and how much people are rocking me no matter what, no matter what it is, you know? Yeah. And, and that feels great to know, like, that these people genuinely, you know, love me and care for me. As far as, like, the music side of things, um, I've always, I always was that kid with the brush in the mirror, you know, singing and dancing and doing stuff in front of my family at, like, Thanksgiving dinners and stuff like that. So I would say, like, when it comes to that, I, I definitely feel like I, I've had, like, you know, a huge support and a huge backing when it comes to that. You and I have something in common and it's not the best. It's not the best. Mm -hmm. Um, When we were young, we were more feminine. We were more Mm -hmm. um, outspoken. We were balls of energy and light. Because of that, we were bullied Mm -hmm. badly. Um, My family ended up having to move me out of any proximity to any black home. They mm. told me I literally went from being in the hood to having Caucasians around me all the time. And mm. what I want people to understand is there were other Black children there. There was a handful. We were, we were speckled in there, but it was predominantly Caucasian. But what I want people to understand is just because I moved to the suburbs didn't mean the bullying stopped. Mm. It, it just meant that the fist and the, the physical aggression stopped. Yeah. But, the, but the verbal abuse ensued yeah and that would that was actually even more detrimental than somebody punching you somebody punches you they punch you it's over mm-hmm. 
But if somebody goes on and on and on with a verbal abuse, that can scar you for years. I was just about to say, it's, it's honestly, you'll be surprised at, you know, how long it affects you. Because yeah. certain things that I do, even to this day, I'm like, I wonder if that's because I was bullied that I, because mm -hmm. I, I feel like I always feel like people are like coming for me. Like mm -hmm. people, like I'm very literal. Like I, I, I'm always like, what you mean by that? Like, no, because, that, you know, and I feel like I'm always on edge or always ready to be on defense because it's like, I'm always used to people saying little underlining comments that was a joke that everybody else in the room got that I didn't get. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because for so long when I was younger, I was a gay boy in school and didn't even know. Yeah. Like people were calling me this name and I'm like, I'm not gay. Like right. that's my girlfriend's over there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it was just like, I, it was always those, those whispers or those jokes or those little backhanded comments that I didn't really get or didn't really understand until after like, Oh, okay. That's, that's what they're saying about me, you know? So I feel like even still now I'm always like, wait, what you, what you mean by that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It takes a lifetime to get rid of those things. Yeah. And uh, a lot of therapy. I've been in therapy for 15 years. That's great. That's so great. But the point is I'm still scratching the surface. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's something. And it's uh, even to piggyback off of what you're saying about how it shapes us, it's still, to this day, I do what I do from a very safe space. Mm -hmm. Not out in public, not out with all these people here and there. And people don't understand that I do that because of the bullying. I, like, I, I have one recollection. I was a grown man. I think I'm 39 now. I think I was 30. Mm -hmm. And I went to the barbershop with my grandmother. Now, mind you, my grandmother. She's getting her hair cut by our friend of the family who's like a, a, a cousin to me, a brother to me, really. And there's a man, and I know all of them from my gym. Because, see, mm. they, like, what I realized was, like, in the gym, they used to make fun of me. Now, mind you, I'm a 30-year-old man. And mm. they're calling out racial slurs, not racial slurs, gay slurs, homophobic slurs. And they're upset because one thing I take very ser seriously is my body. So mm -hmm. I was stronger than them. I was lift bench pressing more than them and do and showing them up basically. And mm -hmm. they, it, it was so bad. I remember one time I told my aunt, my aunt was working out with me and she was like, I'm about to, I'm about to throw this weight. I'm about to throw this weight. Uh, and I'm like, no, don't do that. I almost got into fights in that gym and everything because yeah. they, would, they didn't want to let me be who I was. Yeah. Go, um, go somewhere else. And I was like, I'm not going no fucking where. Mm -hmm. I'm standing right here because I pay this membership and this is the ground that I'm standing on. And that's always been me. Like yeah. even from a little kid, I fought back even from a little kid. But I go into the barbershop with my grandmother. And while we're waiting, I'm speaking. There's a man from the gym. I recognize him. He's one of the, the antagonists. He has his five-year-old son with him. His five-year-old son runs over to me while I'm talking to my grandmother, turn and starts punching me in my head. Now, mind you, I realize this is a child and I'm 30. So I cover my face and push him backwards because he's small. Mm -hmm. His father did nothing. The barber was like, yo, get your fucking son. Like, this is ridiculous. You, you can't do that. Like, the barber is going off. Father did not move. Mm. He looked at me and did not move. Now, mind you, I'm 30 years old. So what did I do? I took the opportunity to educate the child. Mm -hmm. He comes over to me and I said, sweetheart, come here. He came over to me. And there's a reason why he came over to me. They don't want to admit it. But to men, my voice is like an aphrodisiac. Mm -hmm. Men like the sound of my voice. All men, even children. I have something very unique and very special and it has power behind it, the power to entrance. Mm -hmm. So I call him over and I'm like, baby, why did you do that? And he said, I don't like the way you sound. It's not normal. I don't like the way you sound. And I mm -hmm. said, and I said to the five-year-old, I said, baby, I can't change the way that I sound. Just like your voice is yours. My voice is mine. Mm -hmm. and, he, and the little boy said, it's just so different. I said, yeah. So as I'm talking to him, the father is watching, not saying a thing. I'm educating his five-year-old son in front of him. 
Mm-hmm. And then the little boy says, I like your voice. Mm-hmm. And I said, I know you do. Mm-hmm. And literally the barber, like the bar, like, oh, he was, he's a rapper at MC. So, you know, he been, yeah. uh, he done been in prison all this year. He was like, be, like he was like, listen, he's like, I'm about to whoop the kid's ass. I'm about <laughs> to whoop the father's ass for now. I'm like, I'm, like, no. I'm like, no, 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 no. Cause I don't need you hemmed up. I got it. Right. And, and I had to handle that. And what I'm saying is even in that situation where you didn't know, did you find that you had to educate people as to who you were constantly? Reaffirm who I, you were? Yeah, I think back then I didn't really know. Mm-hmm. You know, it really took it really took a long time for me to really even accept that part of me. Yeah. So like you said, like when I was younger, I was a feminine. I was the obvious gay boy. But as time went on, I wasn't. So when I came out, it was a shock because it was like I was taking so much back. Yeah you know, constantly taking away things that really actually made me dope. Yeah. But because the world showed me that it didn't and because society was telling me that it didn't, I was constantly shaving away and becoming more of, of what I thought I should be and what, yeah. what a boy should be. So yeah. at that time, I don't think I really was educating people. I was just more so just, just cutting up and getting back. But now, now that I'm in this, in this position and now that I've done what I've did as far as like come up, I know that I'm in a position to be able to teach. And yeah. to be able to change the mindset, especially for not just people like me, because, you know, people would be like, oh, well, I like you because you're masculine. No, not just <laughs> not just me, all of us. You know what I'm saying? And I have been in a lot of positions now. So I do feel like, all right, there's a need right here that I, that I have to I have to fill this void. I have to answer these questions. I have to make sure that, you know, there is no confusion. Yeah. And like how that little boy said, yeah, you're different. Yeah. I want you to know that different is OK, though. Yeah. And he, he changed his answer. Yeah. I like your voice. Yeah. And even even with you'll be surprised now that I'm an educator, even with my students, yeah. it's stuff that once my students found out my sexuality because they found my YouTube channel, yeah. it's stuff that students have told me that their parents have said yeah. about me. Yeah. Why is he a teacher if he's like that? Da, 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 like so much stuff. So I've had to like teach them like, hey, you know, it's only so much I can say because that, you know, there's still, you know, boundaries that we have to stay in within the classroom. There's only certain stuff we should be talking about and sexuality is definitely not one of them. But I still try to make sure I use those moments to be able to educate because I know that they know that Mr. J is dope. And I know that they love Mr. J no matter what he is. You know what I'm saying? So there's been a lot of moments where I do feel like I've had to educate. And I'm proud of those moments because you never know if somebody else is going to encounter an interaction to where they'll they'll learn that knowledge or not. And And it could take just me to be able to change the way that you're treating other people or the way that you're acting in other situations. I mean, even within my own family, like I've learned that. My little sister's just bullying somebody for being gay. Yeah. So, and it, the reason why I never was able to really have a conversation with them was because when I first came out, I told my parents, hey, I could talk to them if y'all want. I was told, no, we don't want you to put that. Well, I'm not going to say we. I was told about my dad. No, we don't want you to put that demon on them. <sighs> so I never was able to have a conversation with them. But once I saw, once I found thought about the bully, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take matters in my own hand. Yeah. I made sure I had a conversation with them. Yo, you know what's right and what's not right you love your brother right you know that this is the situation you wouldn't want nobody to, to bully or talk about me yada 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 yeah. um and i'm glad that it was a conversation that we had because it was it was a moment for them to understand like my sister even said when my cousin had told her like how can you talk about this person when your brother's gay and she was like oh he's not gay no more because he doesn't date that boy anymore like no nah, <laughs> that, that's that's not how it works like, you know? so it's it's interesting to see how you know younger people process it, especially based on the things that they're being taught. Um, so yeah, I'm really proud of the moments that I have had to teach. But even not even just younger people, adults too. Like I feel like yeah. um, one of the main things that I want to get across, and especially in the documentary, was that this wasn't my choice. Yeah, I didn't choose to be this way. I didn't say, yeah. you know what, I'm about to, I'm about to fuck everybody mind up and just. All right. to- <laughs> no, that wasn't that wasn't the plan. This was me. And it took so long for me to love me and for me to learn that this is me. Yeah. I was trying to get rid of this for so long and it ain't going nowhere. Yeah. So it took for me to learn that, to be able to teach that. Like, yo, yeah. when you see people like me, like, know that we're not just choosing to be this way. We're not trying to be different. Like, we just are different. Yeah. This is what it is. Yeah. You know, even with even with that, you know, for so long, now, mind you, I was I was on the other end of the spectrum. I knew what I was at five. I knew, I knew, 
I didn't know what my life would be like, but I knew. So I always knew, but the thing was when the bullying and the taunting and the beatings ensued, yeah. I was terrified to make them right because I felt that if I finally made them right, they'd kill me. Mm. It was that bad. And it's amazing. And I'm not going to stay here. I just, I, I wanted to say that with you because I, I, when I watched that part of your story, I was angry because I was like, here's this, uh, once again, another extraordinary spirit with doing extraordinary things mm-hmm. for the people around him, the world. Like, you know, the, here's another spirit that y'all try to kill. Mm-hmm. And it's like, cause I, I was watching you, like I was bullied like every day, every day. And I knew what that was like. And I'm like, y'all almost, y'all could have literally caused him to not be here. Yeah. I was so worried about suicidal it, thoughts. It definitely, it definitely was, was that bad. Yeah. I was worried about suicidal thoughts. And, you know, I just, when I saw your story, I thought about so many other people that didn't have a platform that are being bullied right now. I don't know if you remember, there was a young boy on it and his, um, it surfaced online, his name was Tyler. It mm-hmm. surfaced online that they had cut the word gay in the, in his, the back of his head. His, his, oh, yeah. Yep. yeah, and they were bullying him on the, on the porch. Mm-hmm. And it went, like there was such an- That was with his parents, right? Yeah, well, his well, what the story said was they were it was a like a friend of the family was the guy, but his sister was present. Mm-hmm. But um, since then, there have been some arrest. There were arrests. I didn't stay up with the story, but he was removed from the home. Mm. He was removed from the home. But um, I don't know where he is right now, you know. But I think about him because you know there are so many of us young black boys being told, you got to stand this way. You got to walk this way. You got to do this and you got to do that. And I'm not saying that you did because I, I like mo- what, what I'm saying is these boys learn how to be more masculine to survive, yeah. to survive because- and, of- I, and that definitely was what it was. I remember for so long when I was younger, I used to always had this idea in my head. So where I wish I could live in a mirror. Yeah that I could see what people would see yeah because there would be moments where things would happen yeah and I, I would be so unaware yeah it'd be like like one moment I'll talk about the most is and I don't even know why this one stick out the most but I remember like this one time and my friends was like on the bus I used to catch the bus um back and forth to school because my my parents never drove like my dad never really had like a car and my mom just like she has a fear of driving so I always was on the bus so we're on the bus and like I'm laughing and this girl goes really loud. I'm so tired of this gay ass laugh. So here I am having a, a fun moment and it immediately became a dark moment. Now it's like, oh, oh my, oh, I didn't know. I was, I was just laughing. It was, it was funny. You know what I'm saying? So it would be moments like that to where it was like, I would, I would be experiencing so much shit. And I'd be like looking back over like, damn, I wondered I did that made them think that. I wonder how was I sounding? How was I looking? Like I would always wonder. If I, I wish I could just see myself the way that they were seeing me because I was just being me and it was always a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So. The reason why I started this way is because now we're going to move into the happier stages of your life. Okay. We're going to move into the fact that you survived, mm-hmm. triumphed, and that you're doing amazing, amazing things. But yeah. I wanted them to know you earned every single thing that you're doing, you you earned it from the universe, from the divine, from the cosmos, you earned it because you went through so much to get, to get it and to even keep it, Mm -hmm. you know, for so long. So we know you're an educator. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. So I started teaching in um, October. So I'm, I'm fairly new. Okay. Uh, but it's been a really, really great experience. And it's actually been really rewarding. Mm-hmm. I've been able to see like the impact that I made on these kids this far. Like even when it came to Christmas break, yeah. the students was crying, I'm crying. They giving me gifts, they giving me letters. You know, it felt like you would have damn near thought it was the end of the school year, yeah. you know? And for me, I was shocked because I'm like, yo, I'm really sad yeah. to go on break for them two weeks for yeah. these from these kids. Yeah. Like I didn't even know that they had that much of an impact on me. Yeah. And to see that I had that much of an impact on them was great. The yeah. main reason why I even wanted to teach was because 
I was watching Freedom Writers probably like a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. And I had, of course, seen that movie so many times, but watching it again as an adult is, is a completely different experience for me. Yeah. So I'm watching this movie and I just started breaking down. Mm -hmm. And then like that next day, I was just like, I want to be able to make an impact like this. Yeah. And I've had teachers um, in my life that's made a huge impact at life, at time periods where I was going through a lot at home. Because once, um, so once my mom moved into like separate houses and my, and my auntie and my grandma, they all got their own house. My dad came back into my life. Like they, my mom and dad was always together. They just didn't live together. So once my dad moved back in with us, our relationship was really, really bad. Mm -hmm. So I was going through a lot at home. Right. And I was acting out in school right. and it took like one teacher to finally be like, yo, like what's going on? Like, why? You know, I felt like everybody else didn't like me or just didn't care. And it showed, you know, but yeah. for her to show that she finally cared, it, it made a huge impact on me. And still to this day, it's my, one of my favorite teachers and I, and I still keep in contact with her. So I want to be that for somebody else, for somebody that's dealing with something or whatever the case may be. I want to be able to be that resource and that outlet and, and, that, and that safe space. Yeah. And not even just her, like I've had many other educators that I just feel like made huge impacts. So I was just like, yeah, yeah, this is what I want to do. Now, I don't know if this, this is not my, you know, lifelong career, because I still got to be rich and famous at some point. <laughs> but as of right now, <laughs> really where I should be. And I'm, I'm getting so much out of it. And I'm really proud of it. You know, my grandmother's an educator. She taught school. Yeah. And they all said, you know, you're going to follow in her footsteps. You're going to follow in her footsteps. But I wanted to go to school. I want to be a veterinarian. That's what mm -hmm. I went to school to become. I was biology. But I had to come out of school because uh, of a medical withdrawal. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed bipolar type 1, PTSD, and acute anxiety from my childhood. And mm -hmm. the bipolar disorder was passed from my parents. So it just, there were so many things that were stacked against me. But like you said, I had amazing educators. My grandmother is, I still, me and my grandmother are inseparable. We're the only two neighbors in the family. We, yeah. love, we love each other to pieces, but when we fight, look out, move, move to another <laughs> country, move because we, we have such strong spirits and yeah. strong knowledge. And, you know, when I left school, I didn't think that I would rise in the capacity to be an educator myself, a mentor myself, a teacher myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people, you ask them, what are you? And they say, I'm an entertainer, I'm a recording artist, I'm this, I'm that. And I learned through other people when they asked me, well, what, what do you do for a living? Because people still ask that, you know, even though we got all our links, you know this, we got all, all right. our links in our bio and they can snoop without contacting us. They can snoop and go find out everything. And I got one of them, one, one stop links. You click it and everything falls down. But um, they asked me, well, what are you? And I said, I'm an intellectual entertainer. Everything about me has to do with the mind. It yeah. has to do with bettering yourself. So I said that to say my grandmother is a teacher. So I know what it's like to have someone in your life that makes a difference. My grandmother has been my rock since I was five years old. I can tell. Uh, so based on the other interviews I've seen, I've seen how much you reference her. Yeah. And I really love that and admire that because my grandmother was such a huge impact on me yeah. and who I am. I usually, and I just realized now, I'm like, man, I ain't got my chain on because I wear this chain every day that has a picture of me and her on there. Uh -huh. um, but I was just getting dress really quick because I just got back from Atlanta today so I was asleep right before this interview so I probably look crazy <laughs> you don't uh, look crazy you look good I just throwing a turtleneck just, you know <laughs> move stuff around but yeah my grandmother is like that was my best friend like we was we were so close she was super dope but she was also like that too she was a really strong spirit don't get on her bass uh she yeah. she had definitely she had definitely cut up but um yeah she she played a huge role into who I am today yeah. Honestly, and I always tell people that my, grand my grandmother gave me two things that nobody else can ever give me, and that's music and God. Yeah, that's the crazy thing is because those are the two things my grandmother gave me. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was a, well, there was kind of a small third, and that was the the, the uh, capital to start my businesses. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> just, you know, just a little. Bit. And that's so I, I saw that I got that from one of the interviews. I think it was the one. I don't know. I, I got that from one of the interviews when you were saying like she invested in you and that she, she did. It. And I, I love that. Yeah. And and I mean, I'm her firstborn grandson. And let's face it, my family was from the hood. So there wasn't much upward mobility. 
Mm-hmm. And my uncles and aunts weren't that much older than me. So, and their, I, my grandfather wasn't in the picture. So she had to single-handedly care for, keep safe and raise four generations by herself because then mm-hmm. my sisters started having children. It was a mess, <laughs> it was a mess. And then factor in all this mental illness. It's just, you know, now I look at my family and it's just like, and they have the nerve to despise me mm. <laughs> they despise me and i'm laughing about it because i i can understand mm-hmm. i understand why you know because yeah. when you look at me i am a reflection of all of the things that they could have been that mm-hmm. they chose not to be yeah so i understand that even when i get hatred online i did a video today very quickly before ours and it was like it was talking about you know ministry and pastors always telling me you're going to be rich like they told me you're going to be rich you're going to live in another country you're going to do this you're going to do that so i said even in the video that i made before this i said don't hate me i suffered i sacrificed i walked alone for this blame your lack of conviction mm-hmm. you know so not only are you an educator, but let's talk about the favorite, favorite thing, the thing you came here for. You're a musician. So tell me, first of all, before we go there, was Atlanta for music? Yep. So I went out there to host a um, showcase and I performed at two events as well. So okay. I, I run a showcase series called Nice and No Sleep Before Full of Dreams. So this Atlanta trip was super dope because this was actually the first Nice and No Sleep that I've done out of state. Yeah. So I've done other performances out of state, but I've never hosted an event out of state. And it was really, really, it was a really dope experience, especially because it proved a lot to me yeah. of like what I could do. Yeah. Like the fact that I'm even in a whole nother state and I'm reaching out to so many artists and I was able to get this great network of artists. Yeah. Like that just shows like the internet makes our, our, you know, it makes things limited, limitless, you know? Um, so yeah, I was out there to perform at the event and to host the event and it went really, really great. We gave out a thousand dollar cash prize at a top performer. Yeah. And it was like a lot of dope talent in the building. Yeah. Um, and I'm really glad of who we chose as the top performer because he was really, really talented. And he didn't even come with a lot of people. And I love to see stuff like that to where it's like you compete against people that brought like 10 people with them. They crowd going crazy. But you come through and you may have only brought your girlfriend or your little brother or whatever. Yeah. And you you turning people in the audience and to your fans. Because when it came to us voting, like a lot of the judges was like going crazy for him. And I was like, I love to see that because that means your talent speaks. Yep. You know what I'm saying? You turned so many people in here that didn't even know who you were to your fan now. Yeah. So it was it was a dope experience. But yeah, as far as the music goes, I just dropped a new project. Yes. Um, it's self-titled, it's called Jamal Moraine and it's available on all platforms. And I'm super, super proud of it because um, I finally feel like, um, I'm, I'm getting into my lane and I'm growing and I'm involving and I'm trying new sounds and I'm not afraid to try new things. Yeah. And it shows like, no, it wait. Really sounds good. before you go on, I want them, I want them to draw the correlation because you've been active for so many years. Mm-hmm. I want them to know that you had a name change. You were Tez, yeah. Tez Hancho before. Yes. Now you're Jamar Moraine. And I just yes. wanted to say that. Please continue. So that you know, so that your following will know. Oh, that's Tess talking to the Queen of Shade. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I went by Tess Hancho for a long time and I actually put a lot of work into that name and brand. So actually me changing my name was like a, a really big thing. But yeah. it was me showing this, you know, this new beginning. And as people are learning me, yeah, I'm learning myself. Yeah. Like that's the crazy thing. Like. And, and that's why I kind of understand, even when it comes to like resistance with family of them, like trying to accept it and stuff, yeah. I get that because it took time for me to accept this too, Yeah, you know? And I didn't know that me coming out was going to, uh, I would have never been able to imagine like exactly how this would have been, you right. know? Now that it is what it is, like, I swear, like I'm learning so much more about me every day. Like yeah. it's, it's really like I'm a whole new person in a way, but, but still the same, you know? Definitely, definitely, definitely still the same in my core. Like I'm not, I'm not too different. But get this, black folk are always the ones to tell you don't change, don't change, don't change. Mm-hmm. The only thing constant in this world, and you know this as an educator, is change. Yep. Like who stays a caterpillar? Exactly. Who, who, you know, yeah. you, you have to, you have to go through the larva, pupa, chrysalis, you know, to be, become, you know, what you were destined to be ourselves go through mitosis and meiosis so that they can birth new cells 
change yeah. is the only thing that is going to is a guarantee yeah our music good. careers are not guaranteed but the fact that we will change at a cellular level for the rest of our lives yeah. that's a guarantee and I, and I love that you can see that in the music like you can see it in me but you can also see it in the music and that's why i'm so proud of this project because anybody that has been a part of the journey you yeah. can hear the growth you can hear me yeah. evolve yeah and it's it's a really dope project so anybody that's watching this <laughs> like, it's on all platforms self-titled Jamar Moran all you gotta do is type in my name it's gonna pop up and it's it's really good music on there so please tell me what it, like you said I'm experimenting with different sounds do you consider yourself you're a rapper so do you consider yourself to be I mean do you sing at all or is just rap is your thing I, I rap I sing um this this new project is is kind of like it's even a couple songs it's more like poppy yeah which I which I've, I've, I think that's like new for me. Like I, I'm kind of, you know, just getting into that. Yeah. So yeah, it's a little bit of everything. Like I, I would just say I'm an artist. Yeah. Just, I like, I like your answer. So uh, what inspired, like, you, cause you're saying I made this change. I'm telling everybody I'm going in a new way. Um, what if, first of all, what inspired you to be so candid? Because even in your documentaries, you talked about everything. You talked mm-hmm. about boys. You talked about the first time. You talk, You know, you just, what I'm saying is I'm praising you because you saw the benefit. Everybody was always sticking their nose in your business anyway. Mm-hmm. So it takes a real entrepreneur to say, well, they were sticking their, their noses in my business anyway. So I might as well continue to yeah. hog my business so that nobody else can do it first of all yeah, when your own story yeah like what what inspired you to keep doing that um because you really don't owe us you know explanations yeah, you know yeah. a grown I, think, man. I think overall what really made me be like you know i have to make this change mm-hmm. is all in love mm-hmm. so like after after being in my last relationship i know right after being in my last relationship um it really just taught me like really a lot about who I, who I was. Like I said, for so long, I was trying to like, you know, hope that it go away or pray it away or wish it away or, you yeah. know, and it was just like now that I'm finally loving somebody that is the same sex as me. Yeah. And I realized like, this is, this is how I want to be loved. And this is yeah. you know what I desire. Like, this is somebody I want to marry. I want to, I want everything with this person. Yeah. Um, I'm somebody that I feel like I love out loud. Like when I love, I want to show the world. I want to show you off. I want to, you know, I don't want to hide my love. And I don't want to, you know, even when it comes to like when it was times where we would like not be together anymore. Like I didn't want to like be secretive about who I was going to talk to next. Like that was always a thing too. Like I had to move like really discreetly and be like super DL, you know? Yeah. So it was just like, yo, like this isn't a love that I need to hide. And like, it just was like, finally, like I need to, I don't know. I just can't do it no more. Like I, I need to, I need to be me. And, and I need to make sure that I look back on myself and be proud of everything that I did. And I don't know if I'd be able to do that if I wasn't being the, my most authentic self. Yeah. Have you um, have you been in talks with any record labels yet? Nope, I haven't. Mm, no, I haven't. I see that in your future. Yeah. Mm, Thank you. In your future. I, I speak that, but that I'll do. But this is the thing. I don't know if what I'm seeing is your own label or a label that's already established. Mm. So I'm gonna ask you as a musician, how, how attached to yourself are you? Because this is the thing. If, we, if you sign with a label as is now, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, we now are having, you know, gay rappers come out and this is that and the other, but I also believe it's a fad or a phase yeah and then everything will start to recycle how attached are you to needing to be yourself because you know what a lot of people don't understand because i've been there i was going to sign with a major record label when i was younger Mm -hmm. and it fell through because i fell through because i had to say to myself they're trying to change me Mm. and i was like i'm not for the change because i will survive I won't survive. They mm-hmm. want me to be this. I remember even I had executives telling me, well, you sing too high and you got to bring that down. You got to go lower. They, they won't be able to, you know, handle 
a man being able to do that with his voice. Uh And I had to tell them, I'm like, well, listen, um, why can't I be the first? Yeah. Why can't I be the first? You're so worried about what is that Uh you're not looking at what can be. Yep. You know? So when I asked you that question, you, the reason why I ask you how attached to you, to your identity and to what you do, the way that you do it is because going into mainstream music, it's, it's really corporate America. Mm -hmm. You will receive a salary to, to the lifestyle that they consider you should be accustomed to. You will receive that. And any monies that they give you will be a loan. And, you know, there's just so much. Then, then we have to negotiate contracts and the minuscule amount of revenue that you will receive as a residual. Mm-hmm. Then you have to also look at, they own all your masters. So there is no legacy and wealth for your future babies. Yeah. Family. So I, I'm asking you because you haven't gotten to that point yet, but I see that point coming. And you will have to make the decision as to whether you want to be corporate or independent, whether or not you can. And I, and get this, I'm an independent. So I know how hard independent is, Mm -hmm. but even when they ask me, the answer is no, because I own everything I do to me. The struggle was real. Even with my grandmother supporting me, it was not a bed of roses and we didn't always have the money to do the albums and to do this and do that. And we took out loans and we did that. And we, and I spent, I spent like when my music sounds the way that it does because I spent thousands. I mean, I'm talking, I'm not, I'm talking 25 to between 25 and $35,000 to Mm. do my music, every part. And I'd be damned if I made that kind of investment and took my grandma's money to go sign with somebody and then they own it, Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I can't do it. So I'm asking you, have you, have you even thought about what you'll do? I do. do. Yeah. I do think that far. Um, I think I kind of never really like have, have come to like a full conclusion only because there's pros and cons to both sides of it you know so of course I do dream of me being super big and I would love to have this big machine behind me and also have that team especially because now um and everything that I do I do so much independently like everything you know what I'm saying and I feel like if anything that's one of the main things that I like like I I do need a team especially because of like um my showcase series and, and like my platform and everything it would be great to have you know me not play so many roles and wear so many hats um, but at the same time, I love being me yeah. and being super authentic and being super genuine. And if it was a situation to where I knew like a label was trying to change me or a label was trying to, you know, misguide me into a different direction of where I'm, I don't wish to go, that would bother me a lot. Yeah. Um, so so it's, it's weird. It's weird because I, I do see the benefits to both and I do see me fitting well in both. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll just have to see the way, way everything will have to play out. I just hope you make the right decision. <laughs> I'm like, boy, make the right decision. Because, because that's the thing. You have a lot of artists that are very smart. Mm-hmm. And they say, you know, I'm going to get in. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to make changes. And once you sign that first contract, there's no room for changes. They got you. Yeah. And yeah. that's what people don't understand. You know, I was told from a very early age, we're interested in signing you, but you're not a team player. They could look at me and say, you're defiant by nature. You're mm-hmm. not going to go quietly into the, into the night. You're a fighter. So mm-hmm. I was like, and then I had to, at, at the time of hearing it, I was devastated because I was trying and I was, you know, I was ready. And I'm not going to lie, I needed the money and the support because mm-hmm. I, had, I hadn't had that yet. And that's why I get upset because there are so many artists that, they only sign because they want help. They need the money. They need this, they need that. But then they don't realize you're pushing someone else's brand. You're pushing the record label's brand. And they start yeah. off with, oh, that's good. That's good. And then here comes your second album. And they're like, well, we were thinking that if you just tried mm-hmm. this and you know your hair and they start and, and they do that, they start picking. And because I, I had one friend who's, an amazing, amazing singer. 
Um, and he's now, he owns his own business and he's a vocal coach, but he still sings, he has a group and, you know, they do it themselves. It's not as large as the label he was with, but they put him on a diet. They told him that he had to be super skinny and, you know, and he was like, he was basically starving to death and he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Like, and that's the thing. People don't understand how much. And the reason why I brought this up is because people don't understand that when you sign to a label, when you sign to a modeling agency, when you sign, you know, as an actor, they own your ass. Mm -hmm. You can't even wipe your own ass without their consent. You can't change your hairstyle. You can't be original you have to be what they tell you to be mm -hmm. and like you said the con to independence is that you got to always be chasing the money because you need the money to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and do what you need to do and you have to worry about the headaches and you have to worry about this yeah. you have to worry about that and there there are cons to that because your money will always be an issue. It doesn't matter how much you make. Money will always be an issue because as an artist, you need to show growth. Yeah. So that means bigger producers, bigger productions, mm -hmm. you know, and then there's the tour. You want to get out in front of people without the, ma the major labels tour support. You ain't going nowhere. Yeah. So, you know. This whole conversation actually makes me think about uh, one of my favorite artists mm -hmm. right here. Um, I don't know if you can see what that is. No, right I here. can't. Michelle. So she was actually, um, you know, Michelle Williams. K. Michelle. Oh, K. Michelle. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I know. I love her too. She's so you know, like she was signed to Atlantic. Um, I'm not fully sure of who she's with now, but I know that she's been having a lot of issues with her labels as yeah. far as like trying to create the music that she wanted to make. For the longest, she's been wanting to create country music, and they've been yeah. telling her. Well, that is not what's going to sell a black woman doing country music, yada, yada, yada. But it's like, this is what I do. This is who I am. And this is what I want to make. She's even went to say, like, you know, with all her previous albums, like she wasn't even picking her singles, you know. So when you think of stuff like that, like as an artist and you creating songs and you like, this is the one I'm excited about this one, this one, about the da, da, da. And then when it comes, oh, that's really not the one we're going with. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. not the one we're going with. Like that would crush me. Mm -hmm. Like I know it would because I know how I am and I'm super sensitive about my shit so yeah. <laughs> that would like you know so when i think of moments like that and i and i have examples of people like that it's like mm, i don't know that's why i say i can see the pros and cons to both sides of it listen i'm gonna steer you to independence as much as i can yeah. <laughs> like i'm just i'm just listen i'm telling because this is the thing in my independence i realized something i did not know mm. and that was that i was a complete person that it wasn't just music, that it wasn't just one way, that I had all these other gifts that I could use and pull from. And, you know, as far as, you know, even when you sign, you have an image you have to uphold. There are mm -hmm. certain things that happen and, you know, people don't think about the stress of that. For me, it would be very stressful because I've spent my whole life fighting to be who I am. I've spent my life physically fighting for my identity. Mm -hmm. So to go somewhere and have somebody toil and start to pick at my identity, right. I, I couldn't handle that. I would, I, would, I would be in breach. And that would be a problem because then they would sue you for everything you have, take everything from you, ruin your career, ruin your name because yeah. you weren't a team player. I had that happen in fashion too. Um, mm -hmm. At first, you know, I was going to go with this... Um, because I'd been to Paris and then I came back and I, New York wasn't the place for me. I, I'm thinner, so that's Paris. But um, I had this one modeling scout and model maker, he really was. And he was like, you know, as long as you stay with me, I'll help you and do this, this, that, and the other. But if you try to leave me, I'll fuck you over, fuck you up and ruin your career. Like they say those things. Mm. And mind you, I was living in the hood at that time with my brother, taking care of my brother, working a job, trying to get out. And I, yeah. and I remember vividly with like wrap, being wrapped around the toilet bowl, crying and begging this man to help me. Mm -hmm. And the honest, the honest thing was he wanted not just to help me, he wanted me to climb into his bed. Mm -hmm. He wanted to own and possess me. Mm -hmm. And my thing is I like, the divine, I'm a shaman, so I'm two-spirited. I'm a shaman, prophet, oracle, seer, healer. I have a lot of different gifts. 
that have come into being with me being the full version of who I am. Mm -hmm. And my gifts would always be like, no, 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 no. So my thing is I look at the industry and there, to me, it just, it needs to change. And my thing is if, if I'm going to change it, I'm not going to change it from the inside. I'm going to create what I am out here and make people go, but he did that out yeah. there without them. Yeah. He, he stayed with it. And it's not easy. It's not easy being independent. It's not. But I can't be the queen of shade ethically, morally, and be a pawn or, a, or belong to corporate America and not be free. I'm mm. teaching my whole brand would be ruined because I'm teaching people how to be free. I mentor how to be your best self. Yeah. And in the one point about being your best self is that you move the way you feel mm -hmm. in freedom and intensity. So anyway, tell us, how did the radio thing happen? Because you have an amazing voice. So how did that happen? So crazy voice story, right? Because I was actually, when I first came out, I wanted to write a book. Uh -huh. And I probably will like later on, but I just, I knew, I finally realized like, yo, you ain't got no time to write no book. And then on, on top of that, I was doing YouTube. So a lot of the stories that I wanted to share was stuff that I could share on YouTube. Yeah. So, but I wanted to call the book, The Voice. Yeah. And the reason why is because um, when I was younger, my voice was what I was bullied for. Yeah. I, I was young. I was, I had this long hair. I had these braids. I had this super light voice. And even when like a sub would come in, they would be calling me a girl. And then all the students would be laughing like, yeah, you're gay ass. That, you know, like it was always a thing. But now I've gotten older and now my voice is something I'm making money off of. Yep. I'm a radio host. I'm an event host. I'm the, I'm the voice that you're listening to on your speakers. So yep. I love how things have come, you know, full circle. So it's crazy that that, that ended up being um, something that I do and something that I love and enjoy so much because I would never would have thought that as a child that that would have been the road that I would have taken. Yeah. Um, but I got into radio because um, I honestly would have to say it started with this radio DJ here in my city named uh, DJ BJ. I was hosting events for him and he he's like the biggest radio DJ here. So that was like a huge thing for me. So he became something that I admired and I was just like, yo, that's dope. Like that's something I, that I, I could see myself doing. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, my big brother, who's no longer here with us, um, he used to want to be a radio host and his voice is crazy like and i heard know. them saying i heard them saying yeah. it's deep, deep and yeah deep. it's deep and yeah you know it, it stands out so um i finally got the opportunity there's an internet uh platform here called oso radio okay um the owner randy reached out to me and was like hey you know we want you to be a part so i had my own internet radio show called no sleep radio which was like a additional branch to my nice and no sleep brand because like i told you i do the showcases nice and no sleep full of dreams um and i did that for about um like a year or a year and a half and then I finally stopped doing it only because um I had gotten to a point where I was doing so much yeah. and I was overworking myself and I had this one day where I just broke down and I was like yo I gotta get rid of something and that was the only thing that I felt like um I had gotten enough out of like I felt like I got everything out of it that I needed to like I got the experience I, I gained you know great relationships yeah. it gave me the opportunity to be able to build rapport with the same artists that was doing my shows yeah so it was just like, all right, now it's time for me to close this chapter. But I still very, work very closely with the radio station, though. Yeah. See, that's a beautiful thing because I, I was the same way. We There are a lot of similarities. And it, what's yeah. so crazy is it's not just me. Your story has to be heard because there are all, yeah. so many of us that are going to be able to relate. I was bullied for the sound of my voice. It yeah. was my voice. My voice. And, and even when I would try to make it. You know what I'm saying? It's, I couldn't. I couldn't. It's still, yeah, it's still I can deeper than I can speak. Yeah, I can sing deeper than I can speak. Like I can go low, but not not speaking. Not no. talking. Yeah, and that that goes back to that mirror thing. That goes back to that mirror thing I was saying because it was just mm -hmm. like I'm like, damn, this is my D voice, and they still saying, it. you know what I'm saying? So it was like, what's going on? Like it was always. <laughs> it is my D voice. And it's unaware. Still I'm gay. <laughs> I was always unaware of how gay shit actually was, and I'm right. like, I'm not doing this shit. <laughs> on purpose it's just what I is like yeah no I made I made money my first you know what's so crazy I had been to Paris modeling modeling is no talking so modeling and then I turn around and I moved I didn't decide to use my voice 
until about 2007, 2008 to make money. Mm -hmm. And the craziest thing about it was it wasn't as everyone, like, like people had made me almost hate my voice so much that yeah. I just, I didn't like the sound of it. I didn't yeah. like it. I couldn't stand it. That's true. And, you know, like they made me hate it so much because I used to hate that being in the hood. And then my voice has resonance. So I would go into the Chinese store and I would dread it because all the niggas would be in there sitting there with their girls and all this stuff. And I walk up to the counter and then I'm polite. So I'm like, and I would try to be so low. And the, 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 the Asians would smile because they knew it was me. Hey, how you doing? And then I'm like, hi, can I get, get poor chicken wings and French fries, please? And mind you, I'm saying that and my voice is radiating in this little vestibule. And I turn around and everybody's looking at me and I'm like, God, am I about to die in this damn oh. store? Like it was really, it was really crazy. And the, the first time I had a man validate my voice i was running track in high school i, I saw that about you you have you ran track yeah, we got a lot in common yes I we have a lot in common except you went more masculine i didn't i, I was like <laughs> i'm a fight i'm a fight i can't catch this so yeah but you you did what was natural because i believe this is natural this is not just you learning oh well okay i gotta do this because men do this no this is who you are i can tell it's who you are so yeah. you were kind of like a late bloomer but uh the first like I had a guy on track and I remember one day and I was voted most talkative. So mind you, look at this. This is what I do. <laughs> I was voted most talkative in high school. My yeah. graduating class voted me most talkative and that shit was real. That shit was true. <laughs> so I'm out at track and I'm talking and I, you know, I've always been this ball of energy. So I'm talking and everybody's quiet. All the guys are quiet and this is black. This is white. And I'm like, and then finally it clicks and I'm like, why are y'all not talking back to me and I'm talking to y'all? Mm. And the one guy said, because we're listening to you. And I was like, and he said, if you ever do phone sex, call us. And everybody was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to tell them like, yeah. Like they start mm. laughing and I'm like, I will never do that. Like, you know, I'm like, oh my God. And that was the first time I ever, use my voice is that mm -hmm. I, I came to be, I became a phone sex agent in 2007. Yeah. I, I learned that from one of your interviews too. Yeah. And that was the first time I got paid mm -hmm. for the use of my voice. And I was one of the highest paid. Yeah. And, yeah. Man, and the, the women hated me. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I'm like, listen, girls, listen, girls, I could teach you to do this. I was going to even do <laughs> classes. I was going to do classes because it was a psychological trick. It Like we learned, my boss was, she's deceased now, but she was a very, very, like she was a maverick in the business and she had a degree in psychology. So she taught me about the man and how the voice could literally get the man to do what you wanted him to do. You know, and I was like, like power. And she was the one that pulled me aside and was like, this is your power. Mm. And I'm like, and she taught me that along with psychological technique. And then that's how I, my whole business, it's all about my voice. It's all about yeah. everything I do. All this voice, 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 voice. Yeah. And it, it worked out well for me, but not everybody that has a voice is going to be famous. Right. Not everybody that has a voice is going to be putting out music, going to be doing this and going to be doing that. So I don't feel bad that I have the opportunity. I do this for the people that you don't hear. I do this for the people you and I, we have to do this for the mm -hmm. ones that don't make it, that don't have the opportunity. We have yeah. to stand up and say like, look, so they can say, well, someone like me made it. Mm -hmm. You know, someone like me. Question. Yes. Have you ever thought about going overseas? I haven't. Crazy enough, I don't even think about leaving where I'm at. Oh, you <laughs> are mad. Wait, you gotta think now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You gotta think global with this thing. I know. I this year I want to challenge myself to start dreaming bigger. And I feel like me doing this show, doing my first show in another state, yeah, had you know been a great start and it has been pushing that thought in my mind even more like bro you could have been did this if you would have yeah, yeah 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 you know so i i have to start pushing the envelope and going further and, and not put myself in this box yeah. because 
I don't be thinking like that far yeah. like, at all. like I just even had a, um, a recent job opportunity about yeah. me relocating to another state uh-huh. and I was just like I never be thinking about living nowhere else you know but I, I was so down for it like I'm like yeah I'm down for it like if it, if it makes sense like we can do it you know but it's just like I don't I don't I don't even know why that is like Maybe it's like a family thing, like my mom and my sister's like, I want to be here with them or, you know, my siblings and stuff. I don't know, but I don't, I'm be, I'm be real, so I don't really be thinking about that. Let me tell you something. Do you know what will change the perspective of your music? What? Go to Europe. Or go to Europe. And, mm. and this is, and listen, I'm saying this, see what people don't understand about artists is we make our sounds and music and our songs from experience. I don't mm-hmm. mean go stay. Book a trip, mm-hmm. stay in France, stay in Paris for a week. Then do Germany, do, lo- do the UK especially, they will love you. Yeah. And, and just see how they live. Like don't even go and perform, like see how they live, eat where they eat, drink mm-hmm. what they drink, you know, like hang out where they hang out. Yeah. And I guarantee you, you'll be sitting there thinking like, the world is so much larger than I thought. Mm-hmm. And there are so many people out here that I can reach and that I can touch with what I do. Yep. I was actually in Paris at 22. And like you said, I was in such denial because I didn't want to make people right mm-hmm. that I was in denial as to what my sexual orientation was. Yeah. And the divine, the divine told me, go to the park up the street. I'm in Paris. I go to the park up the street. I sit down on, in the, on the grass because they lay out in the grass and it's beautiful there. They have a lot of parks. And I love that. I was always in the parks. And uh, the divine said, brace yourself. And I said, what? He said, you know, you're gay, right? Mm. God had to tell me. God had to tell me. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget. I said, I know. And as I said, I know, I started bawling crying Mm -hmm. and screaming now mind you all these people laying on the on the on their towels and things the french they're looking like is she all right because i had long hair is she all right is she all right are you okay ma'am are you all right i couldn't even answer them i just was screaming and crying and screaming and screaming and it was releasing years and years and years of oh my god they're right they're beating me because i deserve to be this i'm this wrong thing i was releasing all of that and then i remember i cried 45 minutes straight. I don't even understand how I, pipes, like, you know, I don't even understand how I I could even talk the next day. And I remember I said to God, what are we going to do? And he said to me, we'll deal with it. Mm. That's the only thing God has ever said to me about my, my being homosexual, ever. That was 2005. People really don't know how hard it is. Yeah. Even even like, so even when I was coming out, like I was having some people send me like, oh, it's because what year was that? 20, like 2021 or 2020. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah, it's, it's 2021, you know? Yeah. Like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, yeah, it's, it's 2021 and it's still hard to be black. Right. So, you know, so you want to add black hard. and gay? <laughs> yeah, it's hard in general. And, and I feel like you they would never understand yeah. what it what that's like to even constantly going through that process of trying to. Yeah. Um, decipher what it is or not or yeah. to if it's right or it, it was a time where and I saw that little nonsense the same thing and I was so dope that he I was so dope he said this because I could relate where he said he thought it was a test yeah I used to really think that this shit was a test that I had to overcome to where yeah. I was starting to get really heavy in church to even trying to overcome this shit you know what I'm saying but it's like this is me and it's not going nowhere and I've talked to people I've talked to somebody that's actually really close to me yeah. who this woman is married with a husband kids and everything yeah. and she shared with me you have taught me so much about my life yeah. because the life that I'm living and now that I'm getting older, I'm realizing more and more that this is not the life that I wanted. Boom. And not only did she say that, she told me the same way how you said you thought that this was something that was going to go away and you thought that this was something you could overcome. I've been thinking that my whole life and yep. it's not going anywhere. Yep. Yep. I wish people knew that. You know, and that's what I was saying. Like, you know, now you just said it. They know now you just said it. I'm like, they know now. 
they know now. That's just saying, like, I just wish people knew that it's just, it's not a choice. We ain't choose to just nah, be like, I'm gonna, it's not you know, a choice. Up a little bit, it's like, not nah. It's not a choice. And literally, that year, the bottom fell out of my life and I became a new creature. Like, I literally was so, that year tried me so much. The acceptance took so much out of me. I, I had to reinvent myself. And one thing my, my psychiatrist always, and my therapist always um, prides me on, um, my grandmother calls me the Phoenix. I have, yeah. the, I have the gift of resiliency. Mm -hmm. I can reinvent myself. I can reinvent myself over and over and over and over and over and again. Yeah. And what I realize is even in reinventing myself, the basics of who I am are still there mm -hmm. in every, every reinvention, still there, yeah. still there. And that lets me know that the core is protected. God did that. I didn't do that. God did that. And in that core is my identity, is my orientation, is my love, is my power and my strength. And you're I right. Like they, so yeah, like they, they don't get it. Like I used to, and this was sad because I think every black man heard this. You got three strikes against you. You're black, you're male, and now you want to add gay to it. Mm -hmm. You're asking for it. And, and a lot of our, and you know what? A lot of the blame is with black women because they're usually raising their sons alone. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they're angry at the father. They're angry at the split. Well, he went out with a younger girl. He left me with a baby to take care of. So yeah. what they do to you is they make you uber masculine to fill the void in their lives. Stand up straight, talk deep, don't cry, do this. The women do that to us. Mm -hmm. And it's because they're trying to build a generation of men that they would want to see and be with. They, they, and that's the thing, it's in history. The black woman shapes humanity, period. You know, so they do that to us. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's sad. Yeah. Because even, even with me being a trans illusionist, this was something I've been doing since I was a little boy. I used to mm -hmm. always run in my grandmother's closets, play with the perfume, do all mm -hmm. of those things. I'm not transgendered. I have mm -hmm. no desire to transgender. I don't have body dysmorphia. I don't look in the mirror and see, you know, something that I want to be or something wrong. I literally have two spirits in one body. There's a lot of masculinity there. I, like I said, I raised two of my nephews and they always said to me, Unc, I never thought I would learn how to be a man. I'm a gay man. Yeah. And I'm like, and I, I think it's, I love that. I think it's dope for people to see that because, yeah. um, and that's what I was saying. Like, yeah. With, within me coming out, I want to learn more about the, the community overall and, and the Take different. Time. Take your time. Take my time. <laughs> And the, and the different types of people that we are, because I also have another friend um, that I met. I actually, uh, he had booked me to be part of his music video. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, I'm saying she and her and all of this. So when um, we finally did a YouTube video together, because he's a makeup artist, so he did my makeup for, yeah. for this one. Video. Yeah. So we did that. And um, I was just like, yo, like, what, what pronouns do you prefer? And he like, bro, I'm a boy. <laughs> you know, he like, matter. I could put this wig on. I could put this makeup right. on. Like I, I don't want to be a woman. You know what I'm saying? Right. I just have, you know, feminine energy that, you know, whatever. And I was just like, that's so dope to see yeah. because we we assume certain things, you yeah. know. So I, I like that, yeah. and, I, and I'm glad that you shared that because um, I think that's important to know. It is. It is like the most successful people in the world have learned how to adorn a costume. Mm -hmm. That's how you become successful. Mm -hmm. You separate yourself and create a brand. And you put a lot of yourself in the brand, but the brand is different. Yeah. It's different. Like I used to, I used to come to the camera all the time as a boy mm -hmm. and just talk with my voice. And people be like, what the hell? Like what is going on? Where's the where's the wig? Where's the dress? You sound like that. Like, and I'm like, get a grip y'all and then yeah. i and then i real but then that was a learning curve for me because then i realized 
okay, if you have the trademark, the queen of shade, they want to see the queen of shade. You got to make the brand more to the forefront. Yeah. And it's so crazy because my poor mentees, like I mentor people. So they'll call me and I usually do a FaceTime like this because you can just see me, you can feel the energy, you can see my hands moving, you can look in my eyes, see I'm genuinely talking to you. I just don't like the fake, the, the, the ear to ear thing. So yeah. when I come that way, I come in a house robe. <laughs> I come in a house robe, a shave ball head. I'm just like, all right, yeah. So now we're going to talk about, you know, instead of being all proper, legs all spread, they looking at me like, oh my God, like what the fuck? to the queen of shade <laughs> and i'm like you are talking to the queen of shade and then once they start asking me questions and i start answering them they're like oh okay there's that bitch like what the hell like and that's the th- and i enjoy that i like that because people are like oh you're so proper and oh you're so beautiful and oh and i'm like thank you but there are many ways to me there are many ways and sides to me and i haven't yet discovered all of them mm. I'm on a constant journey of discovery at 39. Yeah. You know, this is not it. Yeah. You know, this is not it. I will not limit myself. I love but, that. You know, like my uncle, I remember my uncle. Oh, look, get this. I was, I was six and my uncles and aunts made fun of me in the living room of my grandmother's house. I can see it. And, and he was basically saying, oh, he's going to be in a dress in a wig. He's going to be in the gay clubs. He's going to be transgendered. He's going to be selling cigars and cigarettes, walking around, cigars, cigarettes, cigars. And I never forgot it. Mm. I never forgot it. And for so long, listen, I I ruined my modeling career, not just from getting sick. I ruined my modeling career because because when I got to- Did you also say that- uh... I feel like in one of your recent interviews, you said that you plan on going back to Paris, right? Oh, yeah, I'm moving. I'm leaving. Oh, yeah, I'm moving back. But get this. When I was younger, I ruined it because I went to Paris and I wasn't yet comfortable with this. And I got Mm -hmm. there and based on my body and my long arms and long legs and long torso and some symmetrical face and small cat-like face, they said to me, you need to do the women's shows. I said, I did not come over here to Paris to be transgendered. I did not come over here to Paris to be a woman. I come from a religious family. I'm just finding out that I'm gay. I cannot adorn this. And you want to send me out in front of the world's cameras in dresses? And they Mm. were like, yes. (laughs) They like, and what I realized being there There were so many men like me, so many men that just, they looked good doing it. So if you look good doing it, do it. Who cares? Make the coin. And it took me 15 years to put on a wig and a dress. Mm. And I think about where I could have been had I just said, you know what, I'll give it a try. But I was carrying cigars and cigarettes. I don't want to make them right. Mm -hmm. And it was my whole life. I didn't want to make these people right because their their being right meant that the beatings were valid, that they were trying to beat it out of me and change me and they were right. It justified in my mind, the beatings. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's why. Because, you know, we do that when our parents, you know, you know, black kids, we get older and we think about how our parents beat us and we're like, well, I was bad. You hear so many people say that. Oh, I was out of pocket. I, I deserve those weapons. No, you didn't. They shouldn't have been beating you. Slave mm-hmm. masters beat slaves. They should have found another way to reach you. Take your mm-hmm. game, put you in the corner, time out, something. They're like, no, white people do that. No, people do that because you shouldn't beat on a soul. A soul. You shouldn't beat on them. It's abuse. So I, I ruined my career. And it was like... <sighs> this actually makes me think about when you, uh, you were talking about like name calling and stuff, right? Yeah. You said that you were talking to your therapist, and, she, and uh, is your therapist a woman? Yes, they all are, they always have been. I will not yeah. be a man. <laughs> okay, you said that she said, um, "Are they lying?" Yeah, and that that was the first time that you was that you know it 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 clicked for you like, mm. yeah, yeah. Uh, I like you it. did your homework. I, I, you, I you did your homework. I, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, damn, 
of you and she was watching. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh my god, and they're like an hour long. Like yeah. you watch them. Yeah. Thank you. I was working on my showcase and I was like reaching out to artists on my phone and I just had like your interviews playing on my uh on my laptop. Oh. I wanted to make sure that like I was fully aware of the platform before I was on it and I and I saw a value in it. I'm like, I love. I love the way that you talk. I love the questions that you ask. I knew that it would be a good conversation, but also I knew for me, like I said, within me learning in the community and stuff like that, I knew that it would be great for me and a moment for growth and a moment for growth for my audience to be able to see this. Yeah. And mind you, I caught something while you were speaking. Did you say that you're newly out of the closet? So my documentary came out. A year ago. Yeah. That's when I came out. So you are baby in this yeah okay listen here stay away from all men they would try to ruin you don't don't go no men give yourself five years before you because right. honey you fresh meat you fresh meat i don't hey. want nobody to see this look the <laughs> shades and leave this man alone he's hey. a good proper man do not try to corrupt him <laughs> no i'm telling you fresh meat oh i mm, <laughs> definitely still new to a lot of it oh my god well that's well that's okay but but let see now you need now you yeah you need friends <laughs> you need friends <laughs> i was an old hoe in my daytime you need friends you need friends they gonna be like listen here now yeah listen now they, listen they, they just want to lay you down they just want to lay you mm -hmm. down like mm -hmm. yeah, it's just it's 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 a lot and 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 the funny thing is i've been i've been out since 2005 and I still, there's still so much I don't know because I was, I was actually afraid of the community because mm. I saw a lot of hatred and a lot of jealousy and a lot of envy and backbiting. And, yeah. you know, you think you're this and you think you're that. And, and I just, I stayed away. Yeah. I stayed away. I didn't, I don't, I don't go to gay clubs. I don't, I don't venture out very much to gay functions. Mm. And someone said to me, he, he, I did an interview yesterday. Um, his name is Micah Marquez. He's like, I got to have you at one of my deviant events. And he does these events, they're parties, they're, they're think tanks, they're talks, you know, just, and there's a lot of men in the room, like 250 men in a room. Oh, that's dope. And, yeah. And he does like this platform. So mm -hmm. I'll have to send you his stuff so you can follow him and get to know him. But um, he's like, yeah, like I, he, he's like, yeah, we got to have you. And I'm just, and I said to him, I said, loads of security loads i was like that's where your budget will be spent for me i need security and mm -hmm. he and he, he he's like really? like okay you know like i don't like and and that was the thing like i real because then once i embraced the homosexuality mm -hmm. then i had to break embrace the naturally gifted talented beyond compare more than a triple threat and everybody wants to sing and everybody wants to model and everybody wants to speak and and you've got all these gifts and it just people envy me very quickly so it's just kept me over here in my safe space inviting people in my safe space like mm. that that is how it has been because i don't want to deal with that it, it can be very vicious and yeah. i just don't I don't want to deal with that. And I'm not saying that the, the community is bad, but especially the black gay community, we need to unlearn what we have learned because right. we brutalize each other. And it's so, it's so terrible. You hear you, the, the whole, are you a top? Are you a bottom thing for me? I, and I'm just going to be candid. I'm sure you've probably heard this before, but when I first came out, I'm like, okay, I'm a feminine. I've heard this all my life. So I got to be the bottom. So I'm like, all right, I got to be the bottom. This is what I got to do. I hated it. I hated it. I like literally. I <laughs> felt like I felt like I was being destroyed. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I felt like I was being destroyed. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> you know. And then I realized, like, there's a term in our culture that most gays don't understand, and that's a blouse. I'm uh, a feminine top. And uh, I and then when I realized that the test was, are men gonna take you seriously? Right. And I found men took me seriously, but they're usually very masculine, drawn to very attractive, feminine and trans women. Mm -hmm. They're drawn to that. 
And those men, I get like, it's so funny because most of the men in my life are very masculine. I mm. have men, I have friends that are designers and straight and this and that. I, I know a lot of people because of this platform. And they say to me all the time, you don't attract just gay men. You attract men. Mm. And like your aura and your voice and your mannerism and your laugh and your smile. And I had to realize like, wow. And I don't tend to play with the DL community because, you know, that's a little dangerous, a little dangerous. And I ain't trying to do that. But a lot of the men that I have, because I've never had a boyfriend, 39, I've never had a boyfriend. I remember you saying that as well. Yeah, never had a boyfriend. So, you know, it was a little bit of a hot when I, when I realized what I was. I started climbing on a lot of bags. <laughs> I started climbing on a lot of bags. Because I'm like, oh, they're going to let me? Oh, yeah. Hey. Like, was, yeah. And then I went celibate for 10 years. Like, you know, but, you know, I was learning myself. And it was like, and I do everything to excess. Like, I do everything to excess. That's my, that's my personality. I do everything to excess. So it's like, I, I got to be the best at it. I got to provoke. I got to perfect it. I got to, you know, I got to make sure, and I'm an entertainer. I got to make sure the experience, you, you, you remember the experience, you enjoy the experience. And I, I take that, I approach that, that skill set with everything mm -hmm. I do, even sex. So it was just like, oh my God. And I, like, I'm glad, I'm glad I've been so good for 10 years because I like, I had one hot summer and that just was, that, it was crazy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. It was, it was crazy, but I learned so much about me. The men were just so different. Mm -hmm. And once you say what you are, you get men that you, you would think they'd be like, oh no, I don't want that. I've never had a man turn me away. I ain't uh, never, yeah, I ain't never had a man turn me away. You said never decline. Yeah, I ain't never. Yeah, I'm so mad at you. I forgot you're a rapper. You know the, you know the, you know the terminology. Is never decline. <laughs> right? Yeah, I ain't never know. My cards work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my black card. That black card work, honey. That, hey. that, that, approve. Approve. <laughs> approve. You can tap it. Approve. So, so yeah, like, but I, if now that I know that you're newly coming out, what I would want to say to you mm -hmm. is take your time. Because I hear in you that you even said in this conversation, I love this person. I want to marry this person. You know, you have those values. And unfortunately, I'm on the other side of this. I'm with the gays where we just some big old debaucherous fucking sex tyrants, you know, like it's just, and I want you, I want you to enjoy being in love and taking things slow. And there are men like you. There mm -hmm. are, there are men like you that want to be connected and monogamous and in love. I'm just not one of them. <laughs> I'm not one of them, but like, I, but, but I'm telling you that because I don't want you to change for someone else. Mm. And what I'm saying, yeah. because that's the thing. And, and I'm saying that because you're an artist. Um, I said this in another interview that I was doing a conversation. When I first got into modeling, I was 19 and I went to like a modeling school called Barbizon. The, mm -hmm. the instructor said to me, you wanna be a model? I said, yeah. He said, get rid of your significant other. You can't have a significant other. And I thought he was joking. And he was like, no, because they're not gonna understand the demands of your career, the mm -hmm. attention that you get because of your career and all of the gifts and all of the this and the that's that you get from being who you are. And they're gonna to wanna to make you choose. Choose me or that. Or they'll want you I had to- somebody out. tell me that at my, uh, at my high school. Actually, the lady that worked in the office at, our, at my high school, she was like, you're gonna go far, man. Like you need to, I had a girlfriend at the time. She's like, I don't see that, you know, for you. Like you, you need to, you know, needs to be in a relationship. Like you're gonna, you're gonna go so far and it's gonna be so demanding. See, and that's the thing. I'm glad that so I'm glad that you heard it before I could reiterate it because mm -hmm. that's the thing. I would never tell somebody, oh, don't, you know, don't love or don't have, you know, someone. But it's yeah. hard, it's hard when we do this. It's hard because yeah. it is so demanding. And the fans, and then people, people tend to, oh, well, I'm gonna focus on my relationship. So they drop off the radar for a couple of years. And then they try to come back and they, they can't regain the momentum that yeah. they had before they left. 
And now yeah. the relationship is over. Y'all done cussed each other out. Y'all done said y'all goodbyes. And now you're even madder because you're like, I could have been so much further and I gave this knucklehead all this time and now I ain't got him or what I want. I can, I can relate to that. Yeah. So but but I, also, I also got some great music out of it though too, you know? So I'm, I'm proud of that. Like this whole, this whole project, if you listen to it like one through nine, it's like, a, it's a story. It's a story of my, my whole last relationship. How many, how many tracks are on the album? It's nine. Oh, it's nine. Okay. Yep. Okay. So it's an album, right? Not an EP. It's a, I've just been calling it a project. The reason why is because I don't want to call it an album because I don't want to rob myself of that, like, first album experience. Right. Like, I want to be, like, this big star. Like, all right, now we're waiting for your album. You know, like, right. I want that. So I don't want to call it an album. I've just been saying, like, my project. Okay. Okay. All right. See, that's it's smart. It's funny because last night uh, I was drinking right before my performance and my uncle told me like, yeah, you said an album on the mic and you were telling me it ain't an album. And I was like, oh, I did? He like, yeah. I'm like, dang. But yeah, I've been just trying to just call it just a project. It's just it's just some more new music and a project I've been working on. And it's, it's really dope. Like I said, it's, it's a whole love story. I can't wait to hear it. I'm going to listen to it because as I'm waiting for this to convert, and so mm -hmm. I can put it up immediately because I don't edit. Whatever yeah. we said is whatever we said. Hey, okay. <laughs> it keeps it, it keeps it authentic. It keeps it real. Yeah. So whatever we said is whatever we said. So while I'm doing that, I'm gonna pull you up. Yeah, you're gonna love it. It's about 30 minutes, so 30 uh -huh. minutes of a of a little love story. I have an album with 50 songs. I, I'm aware. It's crazy. And that just goes to show, like I said, that work ethic is crazy. Yeah. And it shows even with this, how many interviews you do and how many. <laughs> how many videos you've already put out before you even started doing the interviews and stuff like that. So yeah. the work ethic is crazy. I admire it. Like, I don't even listen, know how you can Listen, but you know what? It, it's the bipolar one. See, bipolar two is a lot more depression. Bipolar one, it became a superpower for me. Once I went to therapy and got it under control and I take medication that helps me regulate the chemicals in my brain, it, mm. it left me with loads and loads and loads of it, like energy. And mm -hmm. then when you're, they always say, but it's, it's a lie. What, if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. That's a lie. You will work every day, but you will work every day doing what you love. You will work every day in your passion, creating mm -hmm. your passion. And like I said, I do everything to excess. So I like those good feelings. Yeah. I get good feelings from doing this work. I get good feelings and I too heal every time I have a conversation, every time I sing a song, you know, every time I release a video, I, cause, cause even with the queen of shade videos, the, the 60 seconds, I would be channeling. That's that whole shaman part. So I would be channeling and, and people didn't even understand. I would do all of my videos in one day. So mm -hmm. I would literally have a block of time, block off a, a, a block of time, do 50 videos, three costume changes in this space. Mm. And then literally release them every three days. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I did all of the videos one day, literally took a couple of hours. And, and with me, that's, see, that's a gift and an that's anointing. A that's a gift and an anointing. It, it, it came very easily to me. I could mm. literally, like, I didn't have to, like, even when I make the scripts, because they're scripted, it just comes to me. I write it. And, but that's my ancestors and the divine. I hear them yeah. around me, even with my music. It's never taken me more than 15 minutes to write a song mm. because I literally hear my ancestors. One of my uncles who I loved, he passed away. It took in, me like three days. I, yeah, no, listen, <laughs> he passed away in 2005. His, my, my uncle Sydney of um, HIV and AIDS complications. But he was like, he was like my favorite uncle. He just was so smart and musical and genius and just mm. lovely. And he only made it to 40 because he contracted HIV early, like it was early, maybe the 70s or 80s, somewhere around there. Mm. And, you know, it was just very hard for him because at that time they didn't have the drugs that they have now. So he was on a lot of experimental drugs and it just tore him apart. And it just, he couldn't take it anymore. And he just, he left. But when I go to write music, it's his voice I hear. And I hear his voice on this side and the actual melody and music on this side. So like when I call my producer, I've already sang the song on my voice memo. I've sang it exactly how it goes. Verse one, chorus, verse two, chorus, bridge, chorus, chorus. I already did it all. So she literally to make the music to go with it. And she says that to me because she's a woman. I love working with you because it's not hard. 
you literally have mapped out all the notes and I don't play an instrument. So I've mapped out all the notes because I sang it. Uh, you that play an instrument. Good. You play an instrument. Yeah, this one right here. Yep. <laughs> this one in my heart. <laughs> so, but yeah, I've mapped it all out. So when I go to, like, it's so amazing. And that's another thing. I get lost in what I do. I love it so much. I want yeah. to do it for the rest of my life. And I would be devastated if I couldn't do it. You know? I love to see that. I love to see that amount of passion. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and, it, and it shows. It shows in, in everything that you do. And, and people can see that and they can feel that. And that's so important. Yeah, because literally the government, you know, with mental illness, they went to tell me, oh, well, we're going to deny your SSI because you can fold laundry in a laundromat. They told me that at my hearing, my state hearing, where I'm trying to get benefits for being mentally disabled or mentally ill. And, you know, they're like, no, we're not going to give them to you because you're young. First of all, you're young. I was younger then. And they were mm -hmm. like, we don't want to put you out of pasture. You can, you can fold laundry in a laundromat. You'll be fine. And I'm like, this brain, this mind, these gifts, this heart, and you wanted me to fold laundry. Mm -hmm. Craziness, craziness. Okay, so. I want you to one more time, tell us what the name of your project is and that, that is streaming everywhere. So tell us what it is. All right, so the project is self-titled. It's Jamar Moraine, that's J-A-M-A-R-M-A-R-R-E-I-G-N. It's available on all platforms. Like I said, it's a love story. It's really, really dope music. I'm super proud of it. Um, so yeah, make sure I go check it out and go stream that everywhere. Where can we find you on social media? You'll find me on um, Instagram, Twitter, at Jamar Moraine. And uh, my YouTube is Jamar Murray. Everything is Jamar Murray. Yes. Now, I did it backwards with you. Give me three words that inspire you. Three words that inspire me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's funny because I've watched the interviews. I think it was the one with Marcus that you asked that. And I was thinking, like, what, what three words? Have, and now they uh -huh. all go. <laughs> they all go. And I was trying to think. Uh -huh. uh, I would say... Three words that inspire me. Or motivate you. I would say like genuineness. Uh -huh. um, because I, that's the way that I want to be remembered. Like I, I want people to be like, his vibe was genuine. Yeah. Authentic. Yeah. Um, I would say, I would say resilience too. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I think I've been able to yeah. deal with the punches. Yeah. And I would say, um, it's crazy because these ain't the words that I came up with when I, when I, when I watched that interview. And I feel like those words are probably way better. But um, lastly, I'm going to just say unbroken. Yeah. Yeah, I would say unbroken. That's That's been like a, a, a theme for me in my life. It's just, you know, like I said, just dealing with the punches and, and also constantly being under construction. Like how you said, like I am 39 years old, but I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I'm still evolving. Like there is no final form of self. Yeah. I'm, I'm always open to learn and to grow and to experience more new things. So yeah. I would say those were, that probably was more than three, but I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> that is all right. It has been a pleasure. So don't go anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the vocal stylings of Jamar Moraine. Yes, yes. Goodbye, but don't go nowhere.